Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Ben, and today for Book Trek 2021, we're talking about James Blish's Spock Must Die. So Spock Must Die uh, is actually a pretty important book in Trek history. It is the first original novel published about Star Trek. Uh, I should say the first adult one. There were some things for younger readers first. But this is the first adult original novel, something that was not an adaptation of the shows, uh, which James Blish had been writing. Uh, originally, just based on, on scripts, uh, without having actually seen the show, and um, sometimes the results are, are quite odd. Um, but, uh, you know, but I think by this point he had actually seen <laughs> the show, and there was a large demand for more Trek. Uh, by this point, Trek was off the air, um, and uh, fans wanted more. So they were asking Blish to give them something, right? Give them, give them some new Trek. Um, he has actually kind of an interesting uh, author's note in the beginning, but I think it's just kind of worth reading as a piece of Trek history. Um, you know, yes, I'm a big Trek fan uh, overall, but I do also like, you know, <laughs> just like most things that I'm into and that I like, I like to understand the history of them, uh, how they develop, where certain ideas come from, etc., etc. Uh, so I get a kick out of little things like this. Um, but this is the author's note. He says, unlike the preceding three Star Trek books, this is not a set of adaptations of scripts which have already been shown on television but an original novel built around the characters and background of the TV series conceived by Gene Roddenberry. I am grateful to the many fans of the show who asked me to tackle such a project and to Bantam Books and Paramount Television for agreeing to it. And who knows, it might, take, might make a television episode or several someday. Although the American network be amused as usual by a rating service of highly dubious statistical validity has canceled the series it began to run in Great Britain in mid-June 1969, which is where he was when we finally got to see it. Uh, and the first set of adaptations was published concurrently in London by Corgi Books. Uh, so by the time he was actually seeing these things in Britain, uh, Blish was American, but he moved to England, uh, you know, was when his adaptations were actually being published is when he was actually able to see the show, which is, you know, probably not the best, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> um, series of events, uh, ideally, that you want one after the other. Um, if the show is given a new lease on life through the popularity of British reruns, it would not be the first such instance in television history. I, for one, refuse to believe that an enterprise so well conceived, so scrupulously produced, and so widely loved can stay boneyarded for long. And I have 1,898 letters from people who don't believe it either. James Blish, Marlowe, Bucks, England, 1969. Um, so, you know, given the, the fervor uh, and excitement uh, of Trek fans, um, you know, their favorite show had just been canceled, um, and, you know, hungry for some new original content, James Blish delivered. Uh, now, this is a book that kind of has a fairly mixed reputation. It's certainly important. Um, is it the best Trek novel? Certainly not. Um, but I was honestly expecting worse from this novel than what I got. Uh, but, you know, it, it starts off kind of strong. Uh, something that, <laughs> you know, you can easily debate about inside Star Trek uh, is a conversation with McCoy that we have in the beginning of this regarding the transporter. Um, now, within the series, uh, McCoy isn't quite trusting the transporter. He doesn't like the idea of his, you know, molecules and atoms being scrambled and reassembled. Uh, but he talks about how, you know, it's still a little bit debatable sometimes, depending on which episode you're watching, how transporters work. Um, <clears throat> are they taking you apart and then sending your, you know, your material down to be reassembled? Or are they assembling your material from atoms and molecules and everything like that that are already there? In which case, your original body was destroyed and now you're being reassembled. Um, and that second one is really kind of what McCoy is talking about. Um, and the whole idea of what if there is a soul and would the soul survive? Uh, and he has a pretty great line in this I like. He says, I am a construct made by a machine after the image of a dead man. <laughs> and, uh, and the hell of it is, 
not even I can know how exact the imitation is. Because, well, because obviously if anything is missing, I wouldn't remember it. Uh, so what if the transporter is reassembling you imperfectly? Uh, or with things missing, right? Um, and that's certainly a possibility that we see in different Trek episodes, and sometimes the transport goes wrong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I like that. Uh, and we proceed to have um, a situation on this where uh, it seems the Organians, who um, had really kind of enforced uh, a treaty or an armistice between the Klingons and the Federation, uh, where they would no longer war with each other, they're these kind of superior beings made of thought. Uh, they seem to be indisposed, and the Klingons start attacking uh, the Federation, uh, and the Organians are not stopping them. So they create this new transporter technology uh, using tachyons to try and transport Spock many, many light years away to Organia. Uh, it doesn't work, and instead of transporting Spock, it creates two Spocks. Um, one of them the original, the other one an imitation. And you gradually find that one of them might be dangerous. And the book actually does a really good job, I think, of keeping you guessing, of, you know, making you unsure exactly which Spock is the real Spock. Um, you know, and that part is actually handled really well. Uh, in the first half of the book, Kirk kind of seems like a bit of a moron. Um, <laughs> he seems very easily swayed <laughs> by uh, what his officers say to him. Uh, at one point, you know, one of the Spock, he, he calls them Spock 1 and Spock 2. And I believe it's Spock 2 that says, well, you know, one of the, one of us, one of these Spocks, uh, might try to replace the other. Um, he says the only logical thing is one of us would have to be destroyed. Uh, and Kirk, like, I think he ends up referring to that as, like, airtight logic, and it's, I'm not so sure about that, Mr. Blish. Uh, if that's really the, the logic where that has to go, and there aren't alternative options. Um, so that part, the beginning of the... After that stuff with McCoy, the stuff that happens just after that with the transporter accident, there's some rough passages in here. Um, the way that, uh, that women are kind of talked about, um, sort of condescendingly, uh... You know, uh, like, he, he kind of depicts the women on board as boy crazy. Um, and just after he talks about, like, um, you know, Yeoman Rand or uh, or Christine Chapel, um, you know, all the degrees that they have and how professional they are, uh, then he says, you know, but basically because they're women, they're, they're still expected to perform as well as the men. And, you know, just unnecessary passages like that. Um, and the other thing that he's not the only one guilty of this. I see this in Trek fiction a lot, but it really made me think of it. Um, you know, Steve Donahue, when he did his uh, book Trek um, original series starter kit, uh, he talked about racism in Star Trek. And what he was talking about was, you know, alien race, racism. Uh, we refer to, like, the Vulcan instead of saying Spock, you know, where you're just kind of a shorthand, uh, so you don't have to keep saying the character's name. You just have to kind of remind people that they're a different race all the time. We also see that with the ethnicity <laughs> of crew members. And at one point, it's understandable. Um, like, he refers to Uhura as Bantu at one point. Um, and you cannot, you cannot um, overestimate or, you know, uh, <laughs> the importance of how important the diversity of the original cast was. Uh, you know, to have an African-American woman as this, you know, communications specialist, as this officer on the bridge, uh, to have Sulu there. Um, you know, it, it was extraordinary, incredibly important. Uh, Nichelle Nichols, who played Ahura, she she's told a very amazing story about meeting uh, Martin Luther King, who was a Trek fan, and how he told her how absolutely important it was uh, that she was on television and allowing African Americans to be seen as they wanted to be seen. Uh, so Trek has the absolute right to be proud of the fact that their cast and their crew is diverse. However, certain things that I think were progressive, you know, when these books were coming out, especially this, I think it was finally published in 1970, but throughout the 1970s and even to the 80s, you know, uh, that pride is deserved. Um, but what seems progressive sometimes back then looks regressive now because authors will often tell you the race or ethnicity of 
somebody like Uhura or somebody like Sulu um, unnecessarily. You know, it, it doesn't have to do with the plot at all. Uh, you're not reminding us that Kirk is white. Um, you know, it's just the default is that if they don't describe the way somebody looks, you just assume that they're a white person. Uh, so sometimes sometimes authors will handle that much better. Um, you know, the, the horror, they might talk about like her, you know, her dark, beautiful complexion or something like that, you know, to kind of let you know, but not have to be so ham-fisted. Um, this one, this is ham-fisted. Uh, and I've read some others that also don't handle it terribly well. And it makes it actually seem more regressive than what it's intending to be. Um, you know, but that aside, uh, I will say that um, Uhura is not badly written in this at all. Uh, none of the, you know, Kirk stops being kind of a, a something, of, you know, seeming like a moron by the halfway point of the book. And all the other side characters are kind of given a chance to shine. Um, you know, they do a pretty good job with it. Or, or Blish does. Uh, he allows them to actually be participants and to seem, you know, very intelligent and to give input. Um, or her especially. She has a pretty good scene uh, with uh, delivering uh, encoded or encrypted information so the Klingons can't figure out what they're saying. Um, and I thought that stuff was actually very good, you know, despite some of those other regressive qualities. Um, this was great. Uh, Scotty, <laughs> his, his brogue in this is so thick, it's almost unintelligible sometimes, what he's trying to say. Um, and I couldn't quite tell if, um, you know, James Blish was maybe kind of taking the piss out of James Doohan and, uh, <laughs> you know, his, his less than stellar Scottish accent sometimes. I couldn't quite tell that. Uh, but it's unnecessarily thick at times. Um, and Scotty kind of goes in and out of it. And I wasn't quite sure if that was supposed to be a joke or not. Um, you know, but when we talk about, uh, I want to mention one other thing when it comes to race. Uh, I don't think that James Blish was, yeah, I'm not saying he's, I don't think he was racist, but I'm saying I don't think that he was as optimistic as Gene Roddenberry when it came to uh, people overcoming racism. Uh, there's a very interesting passage in here, um, and it really, it kind of, it partly reflects the fact that, yeah, Christine Chappell kind of had a little thing for Spock in the show, but also when the show was being produced, Leonard Nimoy got the most fan mail, um, especially from women. Uh, and this is kind of reflected a little bit in the book where Kirk is trying to figure out why all these women are so attracted to Spock. And, um, he has a very interesting couple theories. Uh, this one was one that really kind of stood out to me. He says, quote, all right. So what was the source of the oddly overt response that women of all ages and degrees of experience seemed to feel towards Spock? Kirk had no answer, but he had two theories switching from one to the other, according to his mood. One was that it was a simple challenge and response situation. He may be cold and unresponsive to other women, but if I had the chance, I could get through to him. The other, more complex theory, seemed more plausible to Kirk, only in his moments of depression. So he's acknowledging this is the sadder one, but still, it seemed more plausible. Uh, that, mo that most white crew women, still the inheritors after two centuries of vestiges, of the shameful racial prejudices of their largely Anglo-American forebears saw in the Vulcan half-breed, who after all had not sprung from any earthly colored stock, a, quote, safe, unquote, way of breaking with those vestigial prejudices. And at the same time, perhaps satisfying the sexual curiosity, which had probably been at the bottom of them from the beginning. Wow. Uh, you know, that that seems way more of somebody <laughs> speaking in 1960 uh, than you would expect somebody in the future to be thinking. Um, you know, Blish seems like, uh, you know, the, the racial prejudice that, of course, he would be experiencing. Uh, you know, this is published shortly after, you know, Martin Luther King's assassination. Um, it probably, that, that dream of equality and diversity probably seemed pretty far away. And of course, the 1970s became a much more cynical decade than the 60s, uh, as far as race relation goes, when, you know, human rights and civil rights, uh, maybe we're not moving as quickly as people had hoped, or as, uh, you know, in a way that could satisfy them. Um, so that was kind of a, a shocking and unfortunate thing to read, I think, in this. Uh, one that's kind of understandable, as Blish's point, but I don't see Roddenberry ever 
really putting anything like that in this. Um, and again, you know, the first half of this book is the rougher half. It does get more fun, though. Um, and it's not at all a bad story. It's it's fairly solid as far as like a pretty decent Star Trek episode would be. Um, and sometimes the writing actually gets pretty good. Um, there's a point towards the end, I'm not going to give away a bunch of spoilers at all, um, where Kirk is on a planet and he is uh, basically being assaulted by illusions. Um, you know, and I think this, this is actually chapter 11 when this is going on. I thought this was actually really well written. Um, I like this one. This is one of the illusions that... Uh, that Kirk is experiencing. <clears throat> he says, uh, with an utterly appalling clamor, he was surrounded by a jungle of primitive machinery, trip hammers pounding away insanely at nothing, rocker arms squealed as if their fulcrums were beds of rust, plumes of steam shot up into the hot, oil-reeking air with scrannel shrieks, great gears clashed and great wheels turned with ponderous groans, leather belts slapped and clicked, Eccentrics scraped in their slots. A thousand spinning shaft, shafts wind up and down the scale. A thousand tappets rattled in as many tempos. And somewhere a piece of armor plate seemed to be being beaten out into what would eventually be thin foil. Over it all arched a leaden roof in which every sound was doubled and redoubled like the ultimate metaphor for the apocalyptic headache. Um, I'm kind of a sucker for alliteration, <laughs> as it is. But as I was reading this chapter, I'm like, okay, you know, Plish, Plish can write. Um, you know, uh, it's not like that throughout the whole thing. But, uh, you know, when he when he hits a stride, it gets pretty good. And uh, I thought that that whole second half of the book, I actually enjoyed. Um, you know, so overall, um, better than I expected. Uh, is it a great Trek book? No, it is not. Um, you know, but uh, this is fun and it's very short. It's only 118 pages. It's a painless, effortless read. Um, and uh, I'm glad I read it. Uh, it's it's one that I, I honestly was kind of dreading going into. <laughs> and, uh, you know, was, was, I would say, pleasantly surprised by the end. Um, so, yeah, not bad, James Blish, uh, for an original Star Trek novel, the first of its kind. Um, I would recommend, if you're a diehard Trek fan, to check it out. Uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting historical curio. Um, there's nothing in here that is canon, uh, especially at the end. Um, again, I'm not going to give that away, but, um, that has to be completely ignored <laughs> throughout the rest of Star Trek. Uh, but overall, um, this would have made an okay episode, um, of Star Trek. So, uh, yeah, Spock Must Die by James Blish. Thank you, BookTube.